from Albert Uchtdorf. It's on retirement. He says this. He says, work can be ennobling and fulfilling. But remember Jacob's warning not to spend your labor, for that which cannot satisfy. If we devote ourselves to the pursuit of worldly wealth and the glitter of public, public recognition, at the expense of our families and spiritual growth, we will discover soon enough that we have made a fool's bargain. Remember, we are only temporary travelers in this world. Let's, let us not devote our God-given talents and energy solely to setting earthly acres. But rather, let us spend our days growing spiritual wings. For as sons and daughters of the Most High, we were created to soar unto new horizons. Now a word to us seasoned brethren. Retirement is not part of the Lord's plan of happiness. There is no sabbatical <coughs> retirement program for priesthood responsibilities, regardless of age or physical capacity. While the phrase, been there, done that, may work as an excuse to avoid skateboarding, decline an invitation for a motorbike ride, or bypass the spicy curry at the buffet, it is not an acceptable excuse for avoiding covenant responsibilities to concentrate our time, talents, and resources in the Lord of the Lord. There may be those who, after many church years of service, believe they are entitled to a period of rest while others pull away. To put it bluntly, brethren, this sort of thinking is unworthy of a disciple of Christ. A great part of our work on this earth is to ensure joyful to the end of every day of our life. So I just thought it was interesting as we think about retirement, to realize there's retirement in some areas, but not in others. Okay, um, today what we're, we're going to do is we're going to continue talking about qualified retirement plan. So we'll talk about a defined benefit, defined contribution. We will spend some time then uh, a little bit on individual retirement plans, IRAs, Roth IRAs, and then some small business plans. Uh, today is really quite quite a bit of just a lot of information, just basically a data dump, so please be patient with it today. I'd like to start first uh, with something from the Wall Street Journal from Jonathan Clements. And it says, off your rocker for a happy retirement don't swap work for the front porch. What we find is a lot of people, when they think about retirement, they don't know what they're going to retire to. They don't think through what are the things that will make a difference for them. And because of that, there's a lot of problems. There's health, deterioration, mental deterioration. So we need to really spend some time thinking about that. So here's what he says. Here's the latest thinking on retirement. Don't. That doesn't mean you shouldn't retire from your job. But what will you retire to? Many people give scant thought to what they will do after they quit the workforce, and the result can be depression, mental deterioration, declining health, and possibly a short life. So when he comes and he talks about the three things, he says work, work does a lot more than just provide a job. He says three things. First, no matter how much you hate your job, it's likely providing you with far more than a paycheck. There's stimulation, there's friends, there's interactions. Two. If you're married, retirement suddenly means you'll be spending more time with your spouse. You know, in my case, I, I, would, I would enjoy that. I'm not sure my wife feels the same way about it as I do. But third, many folks have the wrong notion about what retirement is all about. It's what I call a vacation confusion. They think that retirement is as rest, what it is, as rest well deserved. Once you're rested up, now what? So you guys really need to think about what do you want to do with retirement? What, what is retirement going to be like? What are the, the things that you'd like to be doing? So he gives us four questions that you really should answer before retirement. Number one, what are your passions? And a lot of times we kind of covered our passions years ago because you couldn't make any money yet, but if you know as you retire, you may have time to do that. Number two, what is your purpose? So it's not enough to have something you like doing. It's got, got to be personal purposeful and meaningful. Third, how will you replace the stimulation of work? You realize work does provide a lot more. And the last one, what's your new role? So as we think about retirement, think about the things that you want to do. You know, I think, you know, talking about what is your purpose, I think that's why a lot of people in their retirement years, they serve in temples and then go on missions. Because not only are we doing what we should, but there's a purpose behind what we're doing. Doing things that we like. Okay. Um, let me start with just a little video. You know what I think that's kind of our <laughs> framework for retirement is you have to make it happen. And I, I use this 
I use this picture too because you know it's like a lot of us. We kind of we think everything's going to work out exactly as we planned. We're going to go right down this, this straight narrow path, and we're going to hit that ramp, and, and, and everything's going to work out fine. Um, I was listening to a conference address yesterday, and it says, you know, we we hope for the best, we plan for alternatives. So it's important as we work through retirement to think about the things that could go wrong and kind of work on those as well. Um, let me just start with a little case study. It's probably something very familiar to familiar to many of you. Two job offers, same city, equal attractiveness. However, one has a defined benefit plan. The other one has a defined contribution plan with a match. 100% match up to 4%. <coughs> Anyone have a similar problem like this? Sort of working through your job offers? Well, we pretty few of us have uh, pensions that are respective employers. It is. It is very rare. But there's some. Yeah, there's some. Which would you take? Why? Zach, what comes to mind as you're thinking through these things? Yeah, I mean, the match is always really, really good. Uh, anytime you can take advantage of that premium, I mean, it's yeah. nice. But there are a lot of things that you have to consider. I mean, you need to consider what your salary is going to be at retirement. You have to consider how long your retirement is going to be. A lot of other things. How long is the vesting period? Yeah, vesting period. <clears throat> we also have to think about the risk. I mean, if you're looking at the 401k, the risk is on you, uh -huh. the employee. The person finds benefit, the risk is on the employer. They set up their pension fund and whatnot. You know, you also have to look to on portability. Again, things that sometimes happen. What happens if the job doesn't work out? You know, at least with your 401k, you can take that money with you. With a defined benefit, but you can't. So really what we're trying to do today is really let's try to understand. Let's try to understand the different programs. Let's try to understand the details behind it. Because the goal here is really for us to make wiser decisions. So when we talk about employer qualified, who qualifies these plans? They're called employer qualified plans. They're qualified by who? Qualified by the IRS. So two different types, employer funded plans, employer sponsored plans. So employer funded plans would be something like a defined benefit plan. BYU has one of those, they're, they're uh, where it is is for, you know, again, it's a formula number of years times your average salary, and that's a that will give you how much they'll get for a, well, in retirement. Um, it's a nice thing. They're very rare. I think we're down to about 22,000 of those plans in the U.S. And then what we've got is defined contribution plans, which are what most of us are, are more, more familiar with, where we put in money now. It may be matched. I think about 80, 89% of the plans now have a matching um, and then our retirement will be based on how much we put in, how long we kept it in, and how we invested it. Again, responsibilities back to us, given back to the employer. Notice that the different type of plans, so we've got our defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans. We divide defined contribution plans into three types, which is discretionary, then it's at the discretion of the employer, fixed contribution, which is required by the employer, an employee contribution where we put those in. And notice by the, the entity type, there's different uh, different types of plans that you could use. Let's look at BYU right now. BYU is a tax-exempt organization, right? So BYU has a 401k. But it's interesting, the church, at least that, from my understanding, the church uses the same plan for all its employees. So it's, why would it necessarily need to be a... A 401k, could they do a 403b? The answer is yes. Any thoughts why why they chose the 401k? And I, I don't know the answer. I'm just assuming there are you know the church has some some for-profit 
corporations, and most of it's nonprofit too, and you can do both with this, this type. But it's interesting how the, uh, the, the entity type has an impact on the type of plants that are available. So different um, IRS codes, maximum individual funded, so a defined benefit, a maximum of 210000 a year. Defined contribution is uh, 53000 Notice that some of the plans, for example, a 401k, what's the maximum this year for a 401k? $18,000. So depending on the different type of plans, they have different maximums. And so what we'll need to do is to understand those two. Changes, um, changes to the plan, um, and, and realize what we're, what we're seeing now is really a big change. Again, in 1983, there was 175,000 defined benefit plans in the United States. Again, this is the most recent data that I could find. In 2013, there was about 23,000. So realize that the number of plans are, are declining. And, and I think we're all aware of the, uh, the benefits to our benefits to the employer. So let's talk a little bit about defined benefit plans. Anyone have fam parents that are on a defined benefit plan? Okay. So what's the advantage of the defined benefit plan? Do you have to contribute? Go ahead. I was going to say it makes it easy for my dad to plan for retirement. Makes it easy because he's guaranteed, right. he's guaranteed a certain amount. And, and at the time of retirement, he'll have to decide how he's going to take that amount. Is, is it just for as long as he lives? Is it as long as he lives? And a period certain is it as long as he and his spouse live? So it makes it a lot nicer. Previously, people were, were with the company and they were with it for you know almost their entire lifetime. And you know we're seeing we're not seeing that now here. So you don't contribute, you bear no risk, you receive a promise of a payout at retirement. Can the company change those payouts after you after you retire? The answer is yes. Can companies cancel their, their, their defined benefit plans? They can, and then it goes over to the uh, pension guarantee, pension, pension benefit guarantee corporations. So, so realize these are promises, and hopefully they'll be able to, to fulfill them. Two main types of defined benefit plans. One's a defined benefit pension plan, which is kind of what we're familiar with. And then the second one is a cash balance plan. This is, again, the one that we're most familiar with. It's something like, okay, your highest five salaries over your last 10 years. Then it's some multiple company determined factor, you know, one and a half percent, three quarters of a percent, something like that. And then number of years in service up to some maximum. Yes? You're talking about the pension benefit uh, guarantee for, and be between that and when the pension is also funded outside of the entity, the company you work for could go bankrupt and your pension could still be fully funded. Yeah. So, a lot so of while it can be reduced, it's usually, it's going to be there in some form or another. Right. Almost certainly, because they have to pay into this guarantee. Yeah. yeah. You have to look into the finances of that pension benefit guarantee company. There yeah. are some challenges there. But, but in cases like this, the nice thing here, in this example here, you get 22000 a year, or about 37% of your final. Uh, Final salary. I have a good friend who worked in the military. So right, so he's in the military for 20 years. He retired there at 50% salary, and he worked in industry for another 15 years. He was in telecommunications. He retired there. And then he went into a, a third career for about eight years, and he retired there. Right now, he's he's living on about probably about 130% of his retirement income. But but I mean, these are things that we need to be aware of. Things that should go into our decisions as to our choice of work. So it's important that we understand that. Again, the advantages, um, you don't have to contribute. It, uh, it could be very generous. It might, might not. Disadvantages, lack of portability. And then also the question, as Clark brought up, whether it's funded or unfunded, that might be something you, you want to look at. Ideally, you'd like a funded pension plan. Then you've got cash balance plans. Um, what's happening now is a lot of these companies that had defined benefit pension plans 
are switching over to a cash balance plan for new employees. What it does is, again, instead of having to come up with a, a required amount that they have to have at retirement, what they're doing, they'll say, okay, we'll fund 4 to 7 percent. Again, the employee does not contribute. We'll grow that at some predetermined amount. And then depending how long they're in kind of the, the earnings of the, the investments, that's what you'll have at retirement. Again, the advantage is don't contribute. Benefits are easier to track. Um, and the, the downside is the benefits may be less than kind of your defined benefit pension plan. Okay, so these are the ones that we're probably not as familiar with. <clears throat> How about defined contribution plans? Any of your parents have defined contribution plans? Boy, stock ownership plans, pension plans, or, uh, 401ks, 403bs. That's generally the direction we're going now. Um, here, again, the employer contributes. The employee, but the thing for the employers, once they contribute, there's no additional obligation. They don't have to figure out, okay, how much are we going to have to set aside so we can make these payments in the future? So it's a lot less work for the, the employer. Employee may also contribute. And again, the, the way the payout is determined is how much is invested, how long is it kept in, and what's the returns that were received, and that will determine your final, your final payout. Generally, three types. Again, discretionary contribution plans. Again, this is at the discretion of the company. I used to work for a company called Emerging Markets Investors Corporation in Washington, D.C. And we had a profit sharing plan. You know, with new startup firms, the first couple of years are pretty, pretty light, but, but thankfully after a couple of years we started making money and then they were sharing that with the employee. When I left there a few years later, uh, I, I got some money from that profit sharing plan, but uh, I left uh, quite a bit on the table because I wasn't fully vested. What, what's the importance of vesting in these plans? When you invest, the uh, plans or become your property. Yeah, they become your property. And normally what they'll do is, it, there are different types of vesting schedules, but uh, they're trying to encourage you to stay with the company. Uh, second one is fixed contribution plans, fixed by the employer, uh, thrift and savings plans, target plans. And then the one that we're most useful is employee contribution plans. Those are your 403B, 401K, 457 plans. So profit sharing, we talked about that, stock bonus plans. What's the concern you have if you have a stock bonus plan as your retirement plan? Diversification. Yeah, diversification. So we want to make sure that, that once you get vested in this, you can take that and kind of make sure you have a, a little bit more diversified portfolio. Money purchase plans, and again, this is very similar. The employer will uh, contribute a certain amount. Uh, usually 2 or 3 percent, something like that, and that will continue to grow at a low guaranteed rate of interest. Fixed contribution plans, um, thrift saving plans, again this is for uh, federal employees, civil service, again it's just a specific amount. So they'll match a certain amount of your contribution, again the key here is for you to, to put up that amount too. Target benefit, what they do as soon as you come on, They'll estimate, okay, if you stay for 40 years, how much are you going to need at retirement? And they'll, they'll put a, uh, a small percent, usually like 1% to 3%. Uh, it could be higher into that plan, and that, will, again, will be yours. And then this is the one that we're, we're familiar with. 89, 89 million people participate in defined contribution plans. 74 active, 89 million total participants. What's the difference between those two, between 74 and 89? <coughs> so the difference is, is this the, the, the amount of people that are retired. What do we expect now? Do we expect the number of retired people to increase or decrease going forward? <laughs> increase, increase. We've got the boomers like myself that are moving into the retirement states. So 95% have matching contributions in 2012. That the sad part is only, I think it was only about 60 or 60 or 65 percent of people actually get those matching contributions. So we need to make sure that we always get those. So when it comes to salary reduction plan, 401k plans, those are mainly for private 
private companies. When you do 403Bs, nonprofit tax exempt companies, and 457 plans are for state and municipal workers. So it used to be that each of these were, were handled differently and the requirements and the contribution limits were different. Now what the government is doing is trying to move all of these in exactly the same direction. So that it's the same limits. So let's talk a little bit about the Roth and the traditional plans. So there's five questions you should ask when you're trying to decide whether you should go a Roth or a traditional. What are those five questions? Do you expect taxes to go up? Do you expect taxes to go up? If you do expect taxes to go up in retirement, which would you choose? Roth. Question two. Because what is what is your marginal tax rate now? Is even if taxes go up or down, if you have a high salary or a low salary, your personal taxes might not be the same. Yeah, so it's your, it's your expected tax rate for retirement. Darren? I was wondering if maybe one of them, because you can withdraw the principal from Roth, so do you okay. think you'll need that? Question two, do you think you might need some principal before retirement? I learned earlier teaching this class that when you take money out, they take it out kind of in... in percentage ratio of principal and interest. Your principal is tax-free, but any interest in earnings will be taxed at 10% penalty plus would be your ordinary income. So question two, might you need some money bef before retirement? In that case, what would you take out? Or what, what kind of plan would you like? You want to rock. Question three. Bye. Well, that that will be the same thing, but that, that brings up a good good point. Employee, if you've got a Roth four hundred one k, will your employer match it in a Roth four hundred one k? No. What will what will they match it in? Traditional. How about question three? Do you want to save more for retirement? How does a four hundred one k? How does a Roth? Help you save more for retirement. Zach? Um, I remember something I was reading about how technically with like the fifty five hundred limit you can actually get more like you know tax tax out like using the rock or Okay, so let's just use an example. Five thousand dollars. You put five thousand in a traditional and five thousand in a rock. So nothing else happens for ten years. So your tax rate is 15%. Let's say your tax rate is 20% to make the math easier. How much, are you, how much spend, uh, spendable money are you going to have in retirement for the traditional? So you put in 5,000, your tax rate is 20%. So how much spendable are you really going to have? Not the 5,000. You're going to have 5,000 minus your tax of 20% or $4,000. How about the Roth? The Roth, what you do is when you take it out, you put the money in the Roth, you pay taxes, but you pay taxes outside of the retirement period. So how much of that $5,000 are you actually spending? Will you, could you actually spend, how much of that is spendable of retirement? 100%. So in this instance, if your tax rate is 20%, how much more are you saving for retirement? Whatever that math number is. Now, do you, are you still paying tax on that, that Roth money? Yes, but you're paying it outside the retirement vehicle. So in essence, what you're doing is instead of saving that five thousand, you're saving that five thousand plus whatever you paid for tax. Question four: Do you need the tax break now? If you need the tax break now. What would you go with? Traditional. Trying to think of what the fifth one was. That's in the reading. So. That we have if the induction is phased out, <coughs> I can't remember. Zach, um, I have a question just about uh, Roth four hundred one ks. Okay. So it seems like it'd be like the best of both worlds. I, I I like the Roth, but it seems like it'd be good because you know you get the Roth and you also get that back. Um, how common are those in practice? Because I haven't heard of them. Um, BYU has a Roth four hundred one k plan. Um, I don't know the percentages. Let me look up and see if I can find that for you. Okay. Um, but they are increasing. More people are making that as an option. Okay. So if, just out of curiosity, if I'm at a 20% tax rate and you put 20000 in, how much really are you saving? 
It's more than 20,000. So the point here is, is we just need to think, think through these, the issue when it comes up. So we talked about that. So uh, again, salary reduction plans, the interesting thing about these 401ks, 403bs, what your company will do is they'll make agreements with probably 10 to 30 different companies. So what they'll go, they'll go to someone like a Vanguard or a Fidelity or a Charles Schwab. And they'll, they'll choose certain funds. And then generally the fund companies will give you a reduction in fees. So for example, at BYU instead of, uh, I believe it's the, the Vanguard S&P 500 fund, I'm not sure which one it is. But through the 401k plan, uh, it's offered at about five to eight basis points less than through, through uh, than you could buy it there. So it's actually cheaper for me as, an, as a, uh, an investor to buy it through the 401k. So generally most companies will have a large cap, small cap, international, bond, so different companies there. And so as you, you will have to choose which of the company options to choose. But then you can put, okay, this is how I want my money split out, and these are the, the companies that I want to invest in. So realize with a 401k, or a defined, these plans, you, you don't have unlimited options. If you do something like a, a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA, Basically, the, the options are about 20 times more. Yes? With 401ks, is it that you uh, go back in and reallocate? Yes, you can. You can do that. Okay. After a certain date, they may charge you if you reallocate too often. Mm -hmm. So, advantages, we talked about these. Okay. Uh, I like this chart here. It just really gives uh, the different types of defined contribution plans, money purchase plans, who's it funded by. What's the contribution? Who's eligible? And loan privileges. What are loan privileges? So you can take a loan against it? Yeah, can, can you take a loan against that? Is it a good idea? Probably, usually not. Yeah, I would hope that you wouldn't do it. But, but again, it may give you some flexibility and things like that. But it's really important. I, once I put money in, in my retirement accounts, I never touch it. Until, until, uh, unless it's for the purpose, purpose that's needed. Okay, questions on defined contribution plans. Okay, let's let's address a, a few other things. Okay, contribution limits. Again, eighteen thousand plus six thousand catch up once you're fifty years old. Um, what I did. For, for, um, for next Monday, we'll be talking about Social Security. And I also put a number of uh, retirement questions that people have asked me in the past. And I separate them out, okay, these are investment questions, and these are tax questions, and these are strategy questions. So what we've done is we've also given you some ideas. In your 20s, what should some of your priorities be? In your 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. So we've just given you some ideas on that. So if you get a chance to, to look through that, um, I, I think it'll be interesting. And then, then if there's a question there that we haven't answered, if you'll email that to me, and if I get that by probably tomorrow about noon, I'll try to answer that question when we get together on, on, on Monday. So we talked about vesting, about how soon is the money yours. There's a number of different vesting schedules. Um, some of those are immediate vesting, some are cliff vesting, some are um, graded vesting. When I left at um, Emerging Markets Investors Corporation, I believe we were we were at a great investing schedule. Okay, how about tax considerations for defined contribution plans? How is the money once you pull out? How is it taxed? Traditional, how is it taxed? Ordinary income. So you've got all of these really good long-term capital gains and it massively converts to ordinary income. So we need to be careful there. How about with a Roth? Not taxed at all. So realize if you take money out of a uh, qualified retirement plan, there's a 20% withholding requirement. So if they write you a check, there's a 20% holding retirement. So uh, you want to make sure that they don't write you a check. You'll go on to your um, some some mutual fund company like a Fidelity or Vanguard. You'll create a rollover IRA, and then you'll instruct the custodian to transfer the assets. It's very simple. It's very easy. And it's been a lot. Required minimum distributions. Anyone heard about this? What happens 
So what the government says is we give you these tax benefits for these qualified retirement plans. <coughs> and so you can defer your taxes. However, once you hit age 70, you have to take a required minimum distribution so we can, we can tax you on them. So what you do at age 69, you calculate up all your <coughs> deferred retirement plans. And then if you're 69, you're 70, you would divide that by 27.4. Let's say you had 200, let's, let's say, make it 25, let's say you had 200,000. Let's say that was 25, so you roughly have about 8,000 that you would have to take out. What do you do if you, if you don't have a need for that money? What could you do? If you're in retirement. Take it out and reinvest it. Yeah, you take it out, you can reinvest it in a taxable account, or you could even roll it over into a Roth IRA too, depending on the tax rate. So, let's talk about how, remember we talked about the strategies, your, your accumulation strategy, your retirement strategy, your distribution strategy. Once you retire, you're going to have to make a decision. That is, how are you going to take this money that you've saved up in your qualified retirement plans? So you could do a lump sum distribution. You could take it all that first year. What's the risk? Yeah, I'll love your money. Mackenzie. I'm sorry, I just had a quick question about taxes again on the okay. Roth 401ks. Are they, so for the capital gains on the Roths, are they taxing that as ordinary or is it? So let's talk about a Roth. You pay taxes? You pay taxes on the way in on the principal. And how about when you get out? When you go out. When you go out, they're not paying any No taxes at all. So, lump sum distribution. The risk here is uh, you may have not, you may have insufficient money for retirement. So you may have outlived your money. Purchase an immediate annuity. Again, you make an agreement with an insurance company based on interest rates prevailing at that time. They'll, they'll guarantee you a certain amount of money. And then you have to make the decision, is that money as long as you live? Is that money a period certain? Is it just for you or for you and your spouse? So realize there's a lot of different things. So if you do it for life and you die tomorrow, how much more we got, what will your heirs get after that? Nothing. How about if you do life or a 20 years period certain? You die tomorrow, you'll get it for the next 20 years. So realize those decisions. And if you, if you, want, you want it for your life and the life of your spouse, it's really a math. And so you'll get less now because it's, it, the insurance company's committed over a longer period of time. Third thing you can do, take periodic payments. You can say, okay, every third year we'll take something out or something like that. And the last one is you can roll it into an IRA. Now here's a question. With a traditional IRA, are there required minimum distributions? How about a traditional 401k? Are there required minimum distributions? Any answers? Yes. How about a Roth 401k? Are there required minimum distributions? This is a trick question. Actually, there are. But if you just, once you retire, you roll it over into a roll over Roth IRA, and there's no required minimum distributions. The, the laws haven't just caught up with the vehicles yet. Okay. Questions on, uh, on vesting, on required minimum distributions? Well, let's go back to our let's go back to our case study. Go ahead, Clark. You were just talking about how uh, with at least right now there's sort of a disconnect between the Roth four hundred one k and the Roth IRA, and how yeah. the Roth four hundred one k does have retirement minimum distributions. It, they'll, they'll change it probably in the next. Yeah, year. I guess I'm just wondering, do you have any do you have any thoughts on which way it will change to? Obviously, we're in the way of retirement. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's enough people my age that they'll make sure that it won't be too, too detrimental to us. So I'm, I'm sure it'll change just in line with the, the Roth IRA where there are no in required minimum distributions. So as we, as we go through this problem, we talked about the challenges. We just don't have enough information. We have to spend time, we have to think through. Hopefully now we've got a better sense. So now most of the questions aren't with the vehicles. 
that we're concerned about because we understand about defined benefit plans. We understand about defined contribution plans. Who are the questions now with? The question now is with Bill. You know what? How long is he planning to be with either company? If he's going to be there for a shorter period of time, the defined benefit plan isn't going to be very beneficial. Going back to grad school, I know I have a number of people here going to med school. So that could be that could be a challenge. Number two is forecast for the company. Is the company viable? I'd like to look at their moats. How defendable is the moat? How well rent is the company? And then the last one is view of company policy. Because the company can actually change those policies after you retire. So the, the question on retirement and which retirement plan to take, you need to have a good foundation. But we need to spend the time and realize that a lot of it too depends on our assumptions for what we want. Okay, how about um, how about individual retirement plans? How many people have an IRA? Raise your hand. Okay. Why did you? Matt, why'd you do an IRA? <laughs> um, Adam says because he told me to, but... <laughs> Adam tells us all the new things. No, I just, I wanted to start investing and saving and still have access to if I needed to withdraw principal, but I just wanted to be thinking ahead. I know time value of money is okay. pretty important, so... Okay. Save money, you do one a little bit, so I think you went, you went with a Roth. Mm -hmm. How about someone else? Eric, why did you put money away? Um, same idea. I've read a lot of articles about if you save in your early 20s, that compounding interest is sort of, uh, a lot more beneficial when you retire around 60. I remember hearing about a student who took money out of the, the credit card at 24% so they could invest in the stock market at 8%. Cameron, <laughs> um, we thought that um, my wife's work would match. <laughs> 100%, we didn't understand investing, okay. so we went all in. <laughs> but that's right, you're still not out, even if, if the company right. does not invest. Right. You know, you, so anything you get is still free money, so I still we recommend people do choice, it. But. <laughs> um, are individual retirement plans, are they very similar to, to kind of the employee qualified plans? Are there differences? What's one of the biggest differences? Contribution limits. Contribution limits. So it's, it's about it's about a third. How about income limits? Yeah. So again, here's contribution limits. Again, fifty five hundred plus a thousand for a catch up. Again, what's the uh, again the same thing too? You're trying to government's encouraging you to keep your money in in retirement. Again, you can take it out for some things out of a tr traditional IRA uh, prior to fifty nine and a half. Uh, if you if, if it aren't if it isn't these exceptions like education, home purchase, then there's a ten percent penalty and it all becomes ordinary income. So we need to be wise in that. And again, the same thing, traditional IRA requires the required minimum distribution. So these exceptions, that means they're not taxed, but they are still subject to the penalty? Yes. So the other thing that's unique about the individual retirement plans is there's income phase-outs. If you make more than a certain amount of income, you're not allowed to get the tax benefits. So notice too that the difference between the, the phase out ranges for the traditional and the IRA, the Roth is significantly higher than the traditional. So here's kind of our limits. If you make less than $61,000, your IRA is fully deductible. If you make more, and that's um, married finally, single, married finally jointly, if you make less than 98, it's 100% deductible. If you make more than 118, it's not deductible. What happens if you make a hundred? Your modified adjusted gross income is one hundred and eight thousand. 
How much do you pay me to die? Like Darren, I'd say is it a percent? Like is it yeah, gradually right in the middle. So that's right in the middle. So it's 50%. You're right in the middle. So instead of that 5,500, you could you could deduct 2,750. So realize that if ne neither you or your spouse is covered by an employee employer sponsored plan, there's no there's no limits. Both of you can contribute. If one spouse is covered by an employer sponsored plan, then it, it bumps up to the Roth IRA. So here's for a traditional Roth. Again, notice the, the significant difference there. So can you have both a, uh, a Roth 401k, if your company has one, and a Roth IRA in the same year? The answer is yes, as long as you're within the limits, the, the deductibility limits. Again, education IRA, uh, again, the same thing here, too. So it's really important that we understand the and understand the differences. How about the question, when does it make sense to convert? Give me an idea why you might want to convert some traditional money to Roth money. When you're unemployed, when you're unemployed. Does that mean does that mean the strategy while we're on our missions because we're basically yeah or you go back to school you go back to school but these are good times. Um, here's the question: Should you have both taxable money? Should you have both uh, traditional money and Roth money in your retirement plan? Why not just have all Roth money? Well, I think at some point it traditional would make sense. I mean, if you're later, I think initially <clears throat> Roth makes more sense, but later on in your career, when you're making higher amounts of money, you have higher tax rates, it would make sense then to go traditional because then when you retire, your tax rate would be lower. So, I mean, you could end up with both, and that can be the smart choice. Could we figure out a way to figure out how much we can, or excuse me, is the tax rate, or federal tax rate in the U.S., is it progressive or is it flat? Progressive. So that means as you make more money, you pay more, pay more taxes. Could we figure out how much we could take out of our qualified retirement plans and pay zero taxes? Let me just give you some. Let me just give you some numbers. Exemptions four thousand dollars. Standard deduction twelve thousand six. There's two of you married filing jointly. How much could you take out of your, out of your traditional retirement plans and still pay zero tax? So, two exemptions, eight thousand dollars, standard deduction twelve six. So twenty thousand six hundred, without paying any taxes at all. So let's assume that you're going to live on, uh, you're, going to, you're planning to live on about a hundred thousand a year in retirement. So what what should that tell you? Your ratio of traditional plans to Roth should be. 28. Yeah. Let's say, let's say you wanted to do, um, you wanted to minimize your tax rate at fifteen percent. So I think that's the uh, that first taxable income bracket's at eighteen four fifty. So you could actually take out or twenty six plus that eighteen four fifty for roughly about thirty nine thousand dollars. Yeah, and you'd only be paying taxes, yeah, at ten percent. And so in that case, again, assume you're $100,000 a year to live on. You're, you're taking $40,000 out of your traditional. What does that say your ratio should be, David? Just say 40, so roughly $40,000 with zero, uh, at, at a 10% tax level. So your ratio there would be 40% traditional, 60%. So it does make sense if we want to be wise in our tax planning in retirement. Because we, using the things that we've learned in this class, you can actually target your tax rate. So here's just some why you might want to translate it, why, why you might want to convert. So how do you do it? So the key here.
years is, again, you have to have enough money to be able to pay the taxes. Ideally, you want to be in a lower tax bracket when you transfer it over. And again, back to our strategies, this is a great strategy in your 60s when you're on missions of converting money from traditional accounts to uh, traditional accounts to, uh, to Roth accounts. Let's do an actual case study. Grab your pencils. How important are these required minimum distributions? So Bill, put money in. He had 150000 in his retirement account. How much is he required to take out of his account this next year? The year that he turned 70. What is his required minimum distribution? What's the penalty for not taking out the required minimum distribution? 50%. So what is this required minimum distribution? Just a side note. The required minimum distribution, is that what you said a minute ago you think would be gone? The baby no, no, that's the required minimum distribution is just for Roth 401ks. Oh, okay. So Roth Sorry, IRAs do not have a required minimum distribution. Roth 401ks right now do, but they'll probably be eliminated. Okay. So what is the what is the required minimum distribution here? Five thousand four hundred and seventy-four. Five thousand four hundred and seventy-four dollars. Um, let's say. Bill, you know, he doesn't really need it. What, what could he do with that? In a Roth account. So he could roll it over into a Roth account. Will he still have to pay taxes on it? Yeah, the year that he rolls it over. He could invest it on something that has low turnover and low taxes, so he pays fewer taxes on it. He lives with his grandkids. He lives with his grandkids. Well, well, I, yeah. <laughs> we'll actually talk about that when we get to the estate planning side. Okay. Questions, how many individual retirement accounts, what types of types of IRAs are there? So you got Roth, you got traditional, you got education. There's like 15 different ones. But traditional and Roth and education are the three that are used the most. But just be aware of those things. How about small business plans? Are these pretty good? And I told you the story about when I came here to BYU to teach, I had some equity that the company bought back from me. First year, I didn't know anything about this. Second year, someone told me about a SEP IRA. You can do a SEP IRA with just one person. And the maximum that year, you could put 25,000 uh, 25, in there. So the second year, I got that tax deduction. I put it in to a SEP IRA, and it's been earning, earning, uh, been growing ever since. So the point here is that I, that first year, I kicked myself because I paid a lot more taxes than I should have because I wasn't wise in my my tax planning. So that's why it's important that we, we learn these things. Um, they are not as the the contribution limits are quite a bit lower. It's interesting. Employer qualified plans are the highest, and individuals are lower, and then um, these are probably probably about in the middle. <coughs> but the nice thing is, is even if you have just one employee and that's yourself, as long as it's not W two income, you know you you, you could uh, it could be a means of saving more money for retirement. So really, there's two different categories here: funded by the employer, which would be SEP, and then the keto plan. And the second is funded by both the employer and the employee. So simple and simple 401k. 
in my case, I was the only employee, one person, I had money coming in. A set was a very easy thing to do. All I had to do was, I went into Charles Schwab, all I had to do was fill out one form and I was able to put money, put money in. Very simple, but not a lot of reporting requirements. A um, nice thing, no required annual contribution. You can uh, contribute up to 25% of the salary. Actually, it's 53000 in 2015. I'll fix that for tomorrow. And again, it's just a tax deferred again. Tax deductible earnings grow tax deferred and employees over the plan. And the nice thing here is you can do a full, you can do a SEP, you can do a 401k, you can do, depending on your, uh, again, your, your income. Is that whichever is higher of the two or whichever is lower? No, um, the there are limits for each of those. So, for example, with a, a 401k, there's no earnings limits. With a SEP, there's no earnings limits. But with a high IRA, there are. Well, I mean, so if, if you earn 20, if you're, if 25 percent of your salary is lower than fifty-two thousand, can you still contribute fifty-two thousand? No, just uh, the, let's say you have you have a small business that you run on your side. You make fifty thousand. Say you make a hundred thousand, you can put twenty-five thousand into a SEP. So the nice thing about the SEP is probably the easiest one to do here. Again, you can see those limits. In 2001, when I put that in, the limit was 25000 So you can see that the government has been increasing those limits. Again, they're tr again trying to help us to encourage us to save or retire. Again, a keto, very similar. It can be either a defined, like a defined benefit or a defined contribution. Again, 20% or 53000 for these plans. And employers give the same percentage to each employee. Again, it's a tax tax deferred plan. <coughs> and then we then we have plans that are funded both by the employer and the employee. And again, small business plans, you've got a simple plan, savings and incentive match plans. And again, up to 100% of your compensation or 12500 in 2015. So you're Individual are the lowest, the smallest limits. Your small business is larger, and then your uh, employee qualified plan is the largest. And the 401k, again, you can see how the limits are going up. My view is they're trying to move these up a little bit higher so they're closer to the, to the kind of the employee sponsored plans, but it'll take a little bit of time for that to happen. And then the last one's a simple plan. No other qualified plan, up to 100%, lesser of 100% or 12,000 per year. And again, it's like everything else, there's a, um, there's a penalty if you withdraw. Again, with the simple plans, employers require to contribute at least 2% a year. So you get the, kind of the equivalent of a match there. So when it comes to these retirement plans, you know, we find that it's very important. It's important that you contribute, it's important that you participate. There was a study done this year by the EDRD Employee Benefits and Research Group. They found the biggest single contributor to whether people were saving for retirement was whether they had a, a, a retirement plan. Whether it's individual, whether it's small business, whether it's an employee. And I think that's, that's the thing that we need to do. First priority should always be the company match. Second priority should be your split between Roth and traditional vehicles. And you know, we've done the priority of money in determining investment vehicles. So I think you have a good handle. Any questions on retirement plans? Qualified individual and small business retirement plans. Okay. So what I'd like to do now is let's Talk a little bit about Well, let me let me share this. I'm not sure how much time we're gonna have on Monday after we talk about after we talk about Social Security. Social Security is gonna take us time. But what I've done is put together this QA on retirement. You can see here, retirement strategies, questions, um, 
Strategies for accumulation, retirement distribution, retirement tips. It's the most important thing I can do now. And then we've got tax strategies. So tax strategies, and these are things here. And then we've got investment vehicle strategies. And then we've got questions on. And then we've got questions on uh, social security. But I thought we would take some time and because tax can have such a big implication. We've already reviewed this a little bit here. Just ask a few questions. How do you determine your taxable retirement split? Will that change over time? How will it change? When you're first starting out, do you think most of your money will go in taxable vehicles or retirement vehicles? What do you think, Andrew? So once you're starting out, do you think most of your money will go into taxable vehicles or retirement vehicles? You mean like ones that are taxed now and ones that are taxed later? No, I mean as retirement vehicles versus taxable vehicles. So, yes. yeah, probably right now, most of you, will you be able to fill your retirement vehicle allocation starting off? Will you be able to put 18000 a year? Probably not. But you'll probably put some money aside for things like um, you know, saving for a down payment on the home. How about is once you once you get more established, you're making better money. Will you likely be able to fulfill all your 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 retirement vehicles? Yeah. So what's a, what's a good suggestion starting off? Well, I think the important thing is I'd probably start off with a 50-50 split and just realize you can change it as you go along. So it's not quite as important. Stuart? By 50-50, you mean we save 10% in taxable, 10% in retirement? Actually, what I would do, the first thing I would do is I would set my emergency fund. Right. And then, you know, pay off my high interest credit card debt. Okay. And then I'd, probably the early part of my career, I'd probably, probably would highlight the, I'd probably put a little bit more in the, uh, the retirement vehicles. Just because that, and then it's, it's, it, that over over time, as you start making more money, you, you'll probably put more in your, you, you'll max out the amount that you can put, you know, the, your savings will be greater than what you can put in your retirement vehicles, and then you, that would cause you to put more in your tax vehicles. Okay. Logic for having both tax deferred and tax eliminated accounts. We talked about this. What's the logic behind it? Avoid taxes either now or later. Yeah, avoid taxes either now or later, but the U.S. tax, federal taxes is progressive. How much do you take out? We went through this process here. How much do you take out if you still pay at least 0% tax? What are the pieces of information we need? Filing status. status, exemptions, and standard deduction. And then also, limit for 10% 10% tax. So from this, what we can do is we just, personal exemptions plus our standard deduction, 26, if you want to minimize it at 10%, 39. And if you itemize, you may be able to take out more. Now, do you need to include Social Security in this? And these calculations. And then yeah, the answer is yes. And there's a, a different question on how is social security how are social security benefits taxed. So can you manage your tax rate in retirement? How would you manage your tax rate in retirement? Get your grandkids to come live with you. Yeah, get your grandkids to come live with you. So I, I, I have Two grandkids really close to home, and if I, if I go a week without that, I call up my daughter and say, hey, I need a load and fix. Can you buy and fix? <laughs> Andrew? Well, I was going to say, retirement's a little bit easier because you control all, all the way to the time that you were investing. You control what vehicles you're going to use, uh -huh. so you can kind of calculate out exactly how much you're going to be taking out and how directly you're going to use that search. And I like this here. So here's some investment suggestions. 
Here, if you want to pay zero taxes, you take out your 20,006. Anything beyond that, you, you take, take it out of lot vehicles. If you want to do 10% taxes, you can take out 39,000, anything beyond that. So theoretically, you can come up with an idea of roughly, you, if you have an estimate of what you're going to need in retirement in today's dollars, you have a goal of what you want to pay here at 10%, you can actually estimate your tax ratio, and it gives you an idea of what percent should be in traditional vehicles, what percent should be in law. Now, are we probably pushing this a little bit too tightly? Are we? Is that a foreman, Stan Planchin, he used to say, he says, you measure it with a micrometer, we mark it with chalk, and we cut it with an axe. So we may be doing that Doing that here. Stan was a, a good friend. He was a Marine sergeant who taught me how to work. Um, but it's interesting stuff. Tax implications, Roth and traditional, are we pretty com comfortable in those areas? I think we are. Okay, let's go back to some strategy. Strategy issues. I just added this. Amy had some questions and she said, she says, you know, you really ought to give us some information on taxes, and then you ought to give us some things that we could be working now on strategies. So let's let's do a uh, accumulation strategies. Give me some examples. You guys are going to have to come up with those for your personal financial plan. What's the most important one? Right. And make sure you get all of your employer match. Make sure you get all of your employer match. You never, you never go into a job without getting that match. And even if you leave early, your contribution is really good. And, and all you have to do is get a little bit of that. It was interesting, I was looking at my account at BYU and seeing how much the company matched, what my match was, and how much that, that has grown as well. Other strategies? How much do I hope you guys save? What's the goal that I gave for yourself? 20%. My wife and I had a goal even more than that. And uh, you know, like that video that we saw, a man with a plan is a dangerous thing. So we talked about some of these. Follow the priority of money. Minimize the amount. New money into lot vehicles. I also, one of my strategies right now is, again, we talked about that. I'm converting uh, taxable money into Roth money. Just paying the taxes on now. We also talked about using um, paying your tithes and offerings with appreciated securities, and using that to rebalance your portfolio. There. How about strategies for retirement? Again, remember we talked about that required minimum amount required to live on. So you figure out at the age you, at the age you retire. What are you going to get from Social Security? What's the minimum amount you need to live on? And then you buy it, purchase an immediate annuity to give you that minimum amount. So between Social Security and this annuity, you would have the minimum amount of a year. So that would be as long as you live, you'd have that money. And then any additional money you could kind of take out there. Okay. How about strategies for distribution? Clark. Um, I was just wondering, so... Suppose you wanted to be able to take mo a certain amount of money out of an account in perpetuity without the account shrinking because okay. of its own earnings. Right. What percentage do you think you could take out of an account and still have it be able to keep up with inflation? Well, I know some people do what they'll take out. They'll take out last year's earnings. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. So if, if their earnings are low, then next year's a pretty... Uh, I've also seen some research that says if you'll take 3.6% for a diversified portfolio, you'll take out 3.6% a year. Then generally, that should be sufficient. You, 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 you should be able to last you. So if you have a million dollars, you can take out 36 dollars. Yeah, something like that. So, so a lot of it just depends. Mm -hmm. and, and ideally, you know, retirement's going to be based on you know what kind of lifestyle. What are the things you want to do? Um, Ideals of distribution, uh, target retirement accounts until you get to a target level for taxes. You're required to take minimum distributions. You can uh, you can roll those into another rollover IRA. 
what is the percentage you take out each year, timing emissions, transfer money from, from uh, traditional to Roth. Here's just a piece of advice. Well, it's important to help your children who are having financial problems, you force priorities to take care of yourself. And uh, again, I told you the story of friends who were going on church welfare because they were paying for their son's tuition at Harvard. That shouldn't happen. And realize your kids, your kids will, um, they have a lot longer lifetime to pay, pay things back. Um, we have a challenge now with a child that's not making a wonderful child just just deciding that you know play is more important than work. And the point here, one of the hardest things as a parent is to say, you know what, we love you, we support you, but don't need to do this on your own. Um, <clears throat> but, but realize that's that's a, a challenge in my area. There's a lot of people who are helping their kids financially, and because of that, their retirement could be jeopardized. So we need to be wise there. So here's some thoughts, strategies. So I'll start with the 20s. Just some ideas. You guys get together in your 20s. What are some good ideas for retirement strategies? So I've got company maps, high interest rate day, debt. Other thoughts? Give me a second. I'm going to make sure that I fit. So I have a question. Um, okay. We talked about the IRAs, you could pull out one of those exemptions for at only a 10% penalty, uh -huh. but no taxes, which sounds like less than you would be paying for taxes. Would that be a wise strategy to save up for a down payment on a house, for example? Or is there a better way to do that? Yeah, there, there's not a, not too many benefits for saving up on a down payment on a house. Because the ten percent undercuts probably taxes. So. so okay, repeat the question again. So if you put your money in an IRA, okay, then you can pull it out tax free for one of those exemptions. So by uh, up to ten thousand dollars, it's only up to ten thousand dollars. So that's the. I mean, it still seems like it could be a, a smart way to save up for a down payment on a house. Yeah, I think it's right. I think it has to. Be open for five years. Two. That's the other thing. Uh, generally, how many years are you you going to wait on this? Well, um, so before, before you. I guess if it were going to be five years, then ten thousand is yeah. maybe more trouble than. Yeah. Okay. So, just give me a couple. So I, I gave you your twenties. How about your thirties? What what could be some? Strategies. Yeah. Well, so just one on the previous thing we were talking about. So, like, yeah, you can still pull it out, but you still have to pay taxes on that. Right? Yeah. So, if you're, you don't have to pay the 10% penalty, but it's not a zero tax rate. Right, right that's right. Um, or traditional. But the, I, to answer the 30s, I think um, the sooner you can get to the house, the better, because if you're, um, I mean, it'd be great if you can do a 15 year, but for you know, I think most people do a 30 year mortgage. If you think you get into it when you're 30, that means we'll be kid up to your 60s and yeah. you retire. So, as soon as you can get to the house, the better. Okay. Other thoughts, Stuart? I was just going to say that. Um, get your 15 year fix done and you can pay it off as quick as you can and then you can max out those terms. The other thing was the 30 year, we've got a little tool, learning tool, you can take a 30 year loan and pay it off in 15 just by paying yeah. an extra amount. So, here's just some thoughts. Strategies in your 40s. I, I, the, the good news is that PowerPoint's there. I encourage you to take a look at it. But what we're trying to do is give you some ideas. Again, kind of, if you have any questions on each of these areas on Monday, we'll kind of finalize those. Social Security will finalize the rest of it. If you have other questions, if you'll email those to me, I'll make sure they're included as part of our presentation. Okay, we've talked about a lot of stuff today. Let me take a couple of minutes and just think through our takeaways. One of the things that we We'll take with us when we leave today. And not only take with us, but one of the things that can help us to be to have a better retirement and have a more successful retirement.
what is going to take away from today? Whatever. We don't need to be limited to one one vehicle at a time or one uh, one route for our money. We can max out several different accounts. And you'll have you'll have lots. Again, with seven kids, each of my kids have their own 529 plan, each of them have their own education IRA. So I have how many accounts? I got like 40 accounts. So realize you, you're not limited to one vehicle. Byron, I haven't picked on you in a while. What, what are some of your takeaways for today? I think the biggest thing for me is, is creating a plan now, and creating your strategies now. So uh, the longer you wait, the harder it is. The less you kind of, the more you miss out on as far as potential savings for your retirement. So, yeah, so creating a good plan now. Creating a plan and creating a retirement plan. Yeah. Like that video we showed the first day of class, the first day of retirement. Um, you know, men with a plan, people with plans, and really accomplish a lot. Other takeaways. I really like what you said about parents focusing on themselves first yeah. and that the fact that kids just have a lot more time to figure it out, but also it's just better for them. I agree. And, and as, I, as I teach these classes, I really encourage parents not to, you know, if your children have financial things, let them work it out. Teach them. Teach them principles and help them. But, but again, I find that people who will always help their children will find that their children will always need help. One more comment. I'll pick on someone. Andrew. Otherwise, it's fine. I think they have a connection. What's your takeaway? My takeaway was that I guess, like, the more I learned this class, it's all about balancing. Just balancing out, like, your tax rates for the future, tax rates now, um, what you're going to use for a house now or for, I guess, fun stuff. You just have to have a balance and make sure that our retirement and make sure that like, your future plans are included in that balance. Part of being financially responsible is being financially responsible and planning for the future. Let me just share a few thoughts and then we'll be done. Number one, there's a ton of stuff to learn and know. You know, you have to make sure you understand the basics and then continue updating your knowledge. Number two, follow the priority money. Get the match first. It's free money. I'm amazed the number of people who leave free money on the table. Number three, even though there's retirement in your work, there's no retirement in Christ's church. Disciples of Christ, we all need to join the Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on.